Okay, so this is called The Art of the Game. It's about uh, what are called hastiludes. So hastilude is Latin. It means lance game. Um, not all of these are involving lances, but hastilude came to be known as sort of shorthand for any kind of chivalric competition. So any sort of or, uh, organized or formal chivalric competition, usually between noblemen, but as we'll see, um, Brian, in Brian's talk, he introduced sort of the concept of the three estates, and this was still a very potent and powerful idea, even into like the 19th century, uh, especially like the aristocracy of like England and France, or England more than anything, saw themselves as the inheritors of the knightly ideal, right? Their vocation, their, their earthly purpose on earth is to fight wars. And in order to prepare to fight wars, you play games, and you play games that are intended to create within you the kind of things that lead to being a good war fighter. So rather than just winning, rather than just playing a game so that you can accrue as many points or whatever, a lot of this is about your behavior toward adversity. It's about your behavior toward the fact that you're, you're rigged up in like a bike seat that's yanked up like this, and you're standing with your feet barely in the stirrups, and you still have to ride and tilt against somebody, even though you're probably going to land on your head, right? Stuff like that is all a big part of Hastiludes because they're all about the making a show of the pain and the difficulty and the performance of doing really tough things with weapons, right? That's the whole basis of all medieval games, right? And the way we tend to look at things, it's a term I, I sometimes call like institutional thinking, where we kind of look at, oh, there's a, there's a city, so they must have had a police force because we have an institution of law enforcement that is everywhere. Or there must be some sort of like very particular legal process that looks a lot like ours. Or if they're doing things like sports, it must be very formalized like the NFL is today. And the reality is it really wasn't. It was kind of whatever you wanted. And what you wanted was to promote the performance of knighthood rather than necessarily create winners within a competition, if that makes sense, right? It's a different headspace to be in when we're talking about chivalric competition, because these guys saw and derived social value from performing well, even if you didn't win. Winning was nice, and sometimes there were prizes, but the idea was like, if somebody went up and, and jousted 12 times and got knocked up off their horse every time, but the 13th time they still got up on their saddle, that was exactly what they were trying to, that was the, the purpose of doing games like this, was to prepare you to just get bashed over and over and over again, and then you still get back up and do it again. That's what they wanted, right? And it's a very different headspace than we are today because institutionally, competitions are about creating a winner. Uh, and you, you play the rules as much as you can derive advantage from them, right? And that's definitely not the case in these. So we're gonna go through and talk a little bit about some forms of chivalric competition, kind of the history of it. And we're also going to talk a lot about foot combats, because I think foot combats are sort of this black hole in human historiography that nobody talks about that are probably 80% applicable to everything, every source that we have. is probably talking much, much, much more about foot combats than they're talking about duels or warfare or small unit skirmishing or whatever other sort of martial fantasy people have, right? Um, and it's all about these kind of goofy, bizarre games, right? So briefly, sort of a history of the tournament. This is mostly what tournaments would have looked like around the time they were starting to get popular, about the 11th and 12th centuries. This is from a book called the Codex Menes, which was written in the mid 14th century. Um, and it's a chivalric lay, they call them. It's, a, it's an illustrated book about chivalric romance. And within these, they have all these characters, right? So this is the, the, the Duke of Anhalt, who's the guy with the other dude in a headlock here, right? Who's the, sort of the hero of this story. And this is about a melee at a tournament and how well he did in this melee at the tournament, right? Uh, and the Codex Menes has dozens of, of images just like this, right? So we know this is a little bit later. We know this is telling like a 14th century kind of a tournament story because there's an audience. You see the women up at the top up there. That's, that's very different from the way the tournament was kind of first started to get going because the first tournaments around the turn of the, the 11th and 12th centuries or so were basically you've got a hundred or so knights who are bored and they want something to do and they want to show off. So they block off a space between two villages that might be 10 or 12 miles away from each other and that's the field. And the job is there's two teams and you go try to capture each other. And that's it. That's the game. 
That's that's a tournament, right? And it's literal warfare. You're you're literally going with with war lances and armor and horses and spares and your squires and everything else, and you're going to knock people off their horses or capture them. And if you capture them, they have to pay you a ransom to get their stuff back. Otherwise, you own their armor and their horse. So this very quickly becomes an abstraction, right? Where it's like if I if I'm jousting Brian and we go and I break three lances against him and he only breaks two, well, technically I win, so I captured him, so he, he owes me a ransom, right? Otherwise I own his horse and his armor. And so I can go to tournament after tournament after tournament and capture knights. I don't win the game, but I can capture six knights and have six ransoms waiting for me uh, right after that, right? Um, there's a really famous knight uh, named William Marshall, uh, and he's pretty notable because he had a book written about him like right after he died, which was in response to people saying like, oh yeah, William Marshall, well, he was never that great anyway. And then somebody took that personally <laughs> and wrote, they called it the history of William Marshall. And he was a very famous and extremely successful tournament knight. Uh, and he was able to like make a ton of money going to tournaments, beating people up and extracting ransoms from them. And he was extremely, extremely good at this. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> and somebody was like, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so because this was so sort of like uh, formless, right, um, every tournament could have been very different. And every tournament would have been very different just based on the terrain it was fought on. So there are there stories in the history of William Marshall where he's like riding around and some knights have, have holed themselves up in a barn. So he gets off his horse and he grabs a pole axe and he goes and like hacks into the barn, right? That's part of a tournament. And we don't think about that because we think tournaments is jousting. But there might be there might be a bridge in between these two villages. And if the if the bad guy team gets there first, well then you have to run individual tilts over the bridge, right? Or maybe you send guys to swim the river, um, or maybe you do what else? Yes. Would there even be a bad guy? Well, there it's the other team. <laughs> <laughs> I'm the good guy. <laughs> Whoever's not on my team is the bad guy. Um, but uh, so obviously one of the big changes between sort of this kind that we're talking about and the sh thing that's shown in the, in the image here is the lack of an audience, or at least the lack of an audience that's not also a participant, right? So if, if you were a young lady who wanted to go observe all the knights doing all their knightly things, you had to get on a horse and follow them. And you had to just be sort of like, all right, where do we think the battle's going to happen? And you had to little ride around and find it. Because again, this could be multiple miles in between villages. They could be anywhere. And this could last three or four days. So if you want to have like the ladies of the court going and watching, like you, you got to get on a horse and you got to go find them. Um, so the biggest difference between this and the sort of the later formalized tournament games is that the, the, the audience for the early tournament are your peers. It's other knights. So what you're trying to do is not show off for women or to, or to get married or, or to get a patron. or what, You're showing off to other knights because those are the people who are in charge of how you are perceived, right? So if you're, if you're going and doing dishonorable things or if you're cheating or if you're cowardly or if whatever, then people will know, right? And that's, that's, you're gonna have, there's going to be gossip. There's going to be people that are talking about you. There's going to be people who are saying, you know... Uh, he, he decided to swim across the river rather than joust against me, and that's cowardly, right? And it could be anything. But there's a big difference between this kind of sort of more formal melee that there's a stand over there where all the noblemen are versus something where you're doing that the people you're competing against are your audience, right? And then you're the audience for everybody else. And that makes a really big difference. And the, the first sort of formalizations of tournaments start becoming to make tournaments more accessible and more visually spectacular for an audience that are not knights, right? Um, and so here's just another picture from the Codex Menes, right? This is a guy who's winning a tournament. He's getting a laurel wreath handed down to him by presumably a young unmarried woman. Um, there's sometimes they have like formalized like queen of love and beauty type stuff we see from like Game of Thrones, but that tends to be more of a late 15th, early 16th century style. Um, which we'll talk about in a little in a little while, right? Um, these were usually called tourneys, um, and tourney eventually becomes synonymous with the melee portion of a larger tournament, right? So a tournament is all of the games, whereas a tourney 
eventually becomes known as just the melee, right? And so these images from the Codex Menes are from a melee. You have a smaller area. It's still pretty big, right? It's like maybe an acre or so, but it's big. It's small enough that you can observe everything. And we have a lot of like images and woodcuts and stuff of, of literally like knights sort of lined up like sardines. And there's like 10 feet in between <laughs> the two teams. And it's like, that's your space, right? Um, like a hundred yards or so, like a football field. If you imagine a couple of dozen knights riding horses with lances on a football field, like that's that's about as packed in as some of these things could be. Because some of them were just hosted in the middle of a town. And so you just have the market space. And that's as big as it is. And you make do, right? So the joust obviously becomes kind of the main attraction um, of tournaments as the, four, the 13th and the 14th centuries go on. By the 15th century, it's basically the biggest draw, right? So here's, here's again, the, the, this is from Paul Sector Meyer. Um, and this is, again, the, the Hohenzoy Gesteck, uh, which, you know, obviously the biggest difference here is these are smaller and more controlled. It's not until about the late 15th century that you start seeing really popularly uh, the tilt, right? So the barrier that separates the two horses. You've got one horse on the left side, one horse on the right side. That's not really something that becomes popular, especially in German jousting, until Maximilian I, who loves jousting. He's a jousting fiend. He's a complete jousting fanatic and starts making that a really big part of the, the imperial court, which it hadn't really been under his father, Friedrich III. Um, and Maximilian's bringing a lot of these things from the Burgundian court. And the Burgundian court is, they love draperies and silks and showing off and feathers and they're, they're the, just the flyest dudes around, right? And Maximilian really loves that. His, his first wife was Burgundian. Charles the Bold was this guy he looked up to a lot. And so he started stealing a lot of these ideas from the Burgundian joust styles and putting them into Maximilian. But the vast majority of jousting that you would see until about the turn of the 16th century would not have had a tilt barrier in between the horses. And the reason the tilt barrier is introduced isn't necessarily for safety or anything, but it makes the horses more capable of running the tilt, right? Whereas if you don't have a barrier, a horse is gonna be like, that horse is, I'm gonna go that way, right? And so there are some just accounts of jousts where it's like 90% of the tilts are nothing, nothing happens because the horses are just like veering off a little bit and you're trying desperately to reach your lance over, right? And you just can't do it because you can't control the horse. So putting them in a lane where they can't go anywhere forces contact. It forces, it forces the, the hit, right? And it's all about weathering the hit. It's all about, again, taking that hit in style or knocking the other guy on his ass if you can, right? Um, around this period too, generally, these are split into sort of two primary games. So they call them, in English, they're usually called the joust of peace and the joust of war. Um, in German, they're called the Gesteck, which literally means like stabbing, which is a little ironic because that's what the Joust of Peace is called. Um, and you're actually using lance tips. Here's the Codex Menes again. Um, so the Joust of Peace is, is the, the lance head on the left, right? It's a coronal tip, they call it, like a crown tip. Uh, and the idea, again, it spreads the impact out. So it's not a point. It's probably not going to penetrate armor or anything like that. It's more likely to hitch on something and break the lance. Right, so that's the gesteck, that's the joust of peace. Um, generally, you'll actually have really different armor. So this, they usually call this gesteck toig. It's like, it's toys for the gesteck is, is literally what it means, right? Um, so these big frog mouth helms and these huge things that are like bolted to your breastplate. Um, these are the kind of, you wear this special armor specifically for the joust of peace, right? And the joust of war, you're using war tipped lances. So they're sharp lance tips. Uh, and you're wearing field harness, right? And it's uh, it's still modified for jousting. You've got extra reinforcements and stuff, but it's at least meant to look like the kind of armor that you could, if you needed to, hop off your horse, grab a poleaxe, and assault a castle with, right? Whereas with the gesteck, you have this big ass frog mouth helm that needs to be bolted to you. It has this elaborate suspension system inside that you need like three squires to rig you into and then get you out of. Um, there's special uh, harnesses and everything that have all sorts of different things. And we've got a lot of images coming up, right? It's just, it's just that it's just that slit at, at the eye. Yeah, there are some of them that have like breathing holes sort of down on, on this side, um, but for the most part, it's just that closed helm. Yeah, um, and that and that again, that's part of that's part of the appeal, right? You're stuffed into this this suit that 
you need to have like machines rig you into and it's hard to breathe and it's hard to see and that's part of the appeal because it is so hard and it is so brutal it's uncomfortable and that's part of the job that's part of your earthly role is to bear that discomfort for everyone else right that's the idea anyway exactly yeah <laughs> um so like the the uh geschiff arts renin right so this is one of my favorite uh, of all time because so this is a, an image from um, a sort of self-published semi-fictional autobiography of Maximilian I called Freydal or Freydal. Freydal is Maximilian I. He's, he's his anime character, his isekai character <laughs> that he's putting into this, this alternate history sort of thing, right? Um, so he has uh, just a bunch of these images. Um, there are several versions of Freydal. Uh, that have like different pictures, right? This is the same tilt. This is the actual same pairing, the same two people that are jousting. And this is a sketchbook from some of his court artists. And then this is what makes it into the actual published print of Friedall, right? Um, so anyway, the most important thing are these starbursts that are up in the air above everything, right? So this is the Geschiffartchen Renin. So it's a joust of war with exploding shields. And the idea is that you wear, you wear this brace on your breastplate. It's like a sliding spring-loaded thing. And you're wearing this grand guard attached to it. And if it gets hit with a lance, it triggers the spring and it shoots up into the air and then bursts into pieces. And the only reason for this is that it's cool. It's spectacular. It's literally, right? It's a spectacle. It's something that's re it's like it's like fireworks. But every time a lance hits a shield, it shoots up and explodes, right? And so it makes this extremely dramatic clash and it makes this thing that's so visually spectacular that it's it's really cool and it takes some um it takes some very specific engineering so this is a picture from the met this is actually a breastplate like you you literally bolt this to your breastplate um and then you put the shield on top of it and this was part of the the mets um a few years ago it was actually 2020 2019 2020 in the winter right before the pandemic um they had this at the Met. They had this whole exhibit about Maximilian at the Met. And I went there and saw it, and it's awesome. Um, but they have the, these, yeah, these little shoots, these little catapults that you put this, the, the shields on, and it makes them explode. Uh, and so, like, that's, that's, that's the headspace that we're in, right? And that's, these are the kind of games they thought were valuable, right? Were, were valuable for, for nightly training and to get people into the spirit of, of knighthood, right? Because the more spectacular it is, the cooler it is for people to watch, but also the more likely people are to do it. And if you practice more, you're going to get better at war, right? Uh, because they saw these things as, as one of the main kind of points of this lecture is that our version, our modern version of earnest versus playful, right? Ernst versus Schimpf is killing or not. And that's not at all the case historically. Earnest is something that you do seriously. That's it. If you take it seriously, it's earnest. And so whenever we look at 3227A or whatever, and it says earnest or playful, earnest is literally whatever somebody decides is important. And these kind of games are. They're very important. They're social promotion. It's, it's a way for you to elevate yourself above your peers. It's a way to show off. It's a way to demonstrate how much money you have sometimes because all of this stuff took money, right? People weren't People weren't building these things and giving them away. You had to pay a guy to make that. And that's a pretty complicated device, right? And to repair it, yeah. Because that, that thing's designed to get hit by lances, right? Um, were there, I saw a couple of hands up, yeah. From the audience's perspective, did they know that these were on the knights? I don't know. That's a good question. Because the knights certainly would, obviously, because they have to be strapped into it. Um, I don't know. I've never actually read a description of, of like, whether they would try to keep this as a surprise because you can see the advantage for that right you can you you can you can hear like oh yeah everybody just <laughs> freaking out yeah <laughs> um so i'm not sure i'm not sure um i imagine just like with most other things sometimes it was planned and announced ahead of time and sometimes it wasn't right because again a lot of these are like there's not a lot of formal rules for stuff like this it's all trends so there were certain types of games that you play that have very specific rules and other ones that just don't, just go and, and do cool stuff, right? Um, so, so yeah, so that's the joust. There's, we'll talk a little bit more about the joust uh, later on as well. But we're going to talk a bit about foot combats.
So foot combats become another kind of major component of tournaments. Uh, and it's a sort of a version of the melee a lot of the time. Usually, uh, foot combats are fought across a barrier. So if you were looking at this image here, kind of in the middle, you see that, that fence separating the two guys with like pikes. Um, if I've got a, I think, close up, I think. No, I don't. Next, maybe over here. I'll explain all these later. A little closer here, right? You can actually see a broken pike tip below this guy. So a lot of foot combats, right, you have this barrier. You wear armor only from the waist up because the barrier protects your legs. Um, and you would do like counted blows type things, right? Where it's, again, me and Brian are across the barrier. We start with pikes. We have to give each other three blows with the pike, and then we move on to the poleaxe. And then we give each other three blows with the poleaxe, and then we move on to the sword. And so it's not, it's not fencing in the way that it's like you try to hit and not get hit. It's fencing in the way it's like, I have to take three blows, and I'm going to do it standing up, and I'm going to do it looking cool, and I'm going to give as good as I get. So you know you're going to get hit three times, otherwise the game doesn't advance, right? Um, there's a really great article uh, that I sort of reference here by Chris Dobson, who's a, like an armor historian. Uh, and he does an examination of a clothes helm that was used in foot combats. And all on the, on the right side or on the left side of the helmet is these dings and scratches and these horrible dents because it was a foot combat helm and people were doing this to it <laughs> over and over, right? Because that's what its job was and that's what a foot combat was. It was, you take this kind of brutal punishment across this barrier and you try, even though you know you're gonna get hit the same number of times the other person is, you try to make your hits better, right? And that's another crazy headspace for us to be in because the whole goal for modern fencing is don't get hit. It's not take a hit well, right? And like we just had a lecture from Jane about concussions, and I'm not advocating let's go bash each other over the head 10 or 12 times and take the best one, right? But this is the kind of game that they were playing. Um, and they're often separated by barriers. They're often done one at a time or in small groups. So because you have judges, right? So there's, there's a guy right up there who's watching and making sure people aren't doing things that are against the rules or illegal or whatever. If you have 16 people all doing that, it's, it's impossible to manage. But if you only have one or two at a time, then you can actually see them and you can get the rewarding sort of, you know, the, the peer pressure that, that makes these things spectacular, right? Um, but they involved everything from, from pikes, as we can see here, to daggers. Um, there were often rules about not being able to pull people over the barrier. So we know that was a thing people tried to do. Um, and the term fighting at the barriers almost certainly involves this. These were also the kind of things that you could make formal duels with. Not in the sense of like, I have beef and one of you needs to die, but in the sense that you're issuing a challenge to an individual person who's going to come specifically for that purpose and fight you. So we know Maximilian I did this to a knight named Claude de Vaudray. So uh, this is from Meyer. This is just foot combat stuff, right? These weird little poleaxe, sword, mace, axe handle things are foot combat weapons, right? They're not meant to be used on battlefields. They were never intended to be. This is purely for the spectacle of the foot combat, right? That's what they're there for. Um, and the techniques that you can use in harness fechten for tripping somebody, wrestling somebody, as long as you're not fighting with a barrier, you can use in a foot combat, right? Yes. Is the coloring accurate? Yes. Yep, this is from Meyer's uh, 1561 manuscript that we're calling the Veldens manuscript. Uh, and it was hand painted. Yeah, yeah. Um, so this is the field harness. Uh, this is the, the harness that was made especially for Maximilian I for a 1495 foot combat that he fought with a guy named Claude de Vaudray. And this is his armor. This is Claude's armor. We have both. We have both. They both survive. We know both of these harnesses were used in a foot combat in 1495 right. at the Diet of Worms. Yes? So why does Maximilian um, he probably does. We just don't have the gloves. Um, okay. Because we know, at least according to Freydal, um, and Freydal is, again, semi-fictional, so we don't know if it's, if it's perfectly accurate. This is the image from Freydal of the bout, right? You see Claude Vaudray underneath the guy on the left there. So this is an image of a foot combat duel we know occurred with the emperor of the Holy Roman Empire and a Burgundian knight who was cool, who was cool enough to be invited, right? Um, so they, in, according to Friedel, they fought with um, 
with bohemian shields and hand axes, basically. So these little war hammers and a bohemian shield. Um, I don't know if that's what they actually did in the real history, but according to Friedall, this is how they fought. And according to Friedall, Maximilian crushed Baudre, um, which, was, which was pretty fun. Um, so last point I want to make, in, in the German, the word that they often use to append to foot combats and to melees at tournaments most of the time is Kampf. And if you see Kampf, I've seen in many translations of, of Fechtbucher everywhere that Kampf they take as battle. And so a lot of people, anytime they see Kampf, they're like, oh, a battle. That means they're definitely using this for killing. And when you look at like Fußturnier Kampf, right? It's all based on foot combats and tournament games. So Kampf doesn't often or doesn't always need to mean murderous battle. It can sometimes just mean going into a melee at a tournament. It can sometimes mean doing a challenge at a tournament, right? Um, so I know that like Parnfeind uh, talks about like Kampfechten and he has a few Kampfstücke and I'm more convinced that those are for tournament games than they are for killing people in lethal combat, right? Um, so that's just a sort of a data point when you look at how to tournament games. And so that's an image of what's called a Kolben turnier, which means a club tourney. Um, club meaning wooden club. So these guys are all, you can see they're not on saddles. They're wearing saddleless horses, or they're riding saddleless horses. Um, they're not wearing armor on their legs, and the armor that they're wearing on their head and chest and on their shield is made of wicker. So these are woven wicker wooden sets of armor that you're using for a Colvin Trenier. And these were, these were usually sort of like tangential games at tournaments. Uh, they were often participated in by squires and by, um, by burghers that were in the city that was hosting it, right? So these are usually not knights quite yet, um, but they are people who can afford horses and harness and be parts, the, you know, in tournaments anyway. But this is like, you have these goofy wooden lances with the big blunderbuss points, right? Um, and some of some of these Colvin Trenier even had like weird games where your your goal was to capture, sort of abstractly, the head decoration from somebody else's wicker helmet. So this guy here, we know his name. His name is Marx Walter. Marx Walter was uh, from a family of uh, of burger merchants who were wealthy enough that they started participating in chivalric games because. By the 16th century, the late 15th century, urban, the urban elite were kind of taking on the mantle of this second estate. And they were serving in militias and they were joining armies and they were, they were performing the same sort of vocational duties as knighthood, even though they weren't knights necessarily. So we start seeing more and more and more the participation of, of the urban elite in tournaments like this by around the 16th century. And Marx Walter wrote a book about it because he thought it was cool and it's full of really goofy drawings. There's one where he's like a kid, but he's like, he's literally this big and he's sitting on his father's lance and his father, like his father's like on a horse with a lance, right? And there's this impossibly small child who's like otherwise like perfectly proportioned as like a fully grown person <laughs> sitting on the front of this lance. And it, it's, it's very, it's very strange. But so this is our boy, Marx. So that's him. Uh, that's just like a self illustration with his three sausages on his crest. Uh, and it has not been captured yet, even though obviously many knights lie at his feet. Um, but these, this is just kind of the goofy kind of games that they played, right? Again, this, this sort of spirit of fun and the ability to just like goof around is a big part of this, right? And so we're going to come back to, there's, there's Marx again with his sausages. Um, so we're going to come back to the Hohenzoi Gesteck, right? So this is the saddle. This is what you'd sit on. So this would be strapped on top of your horse, and then they would lay this big kind of shield in front of your feet, and you'd actually put your feet into little like bike sort of feet things on that kind of forward part of the saddle. And the idea again being that when you get hit, you're much more likely to just, <clears throat> just completely topple out of the horse uh, and look really goofy while you do it, right? That's the front. You would sit on that kind of blade, yeah. <laughs> There are, there are beakless battles yes. for bicycles that yeah. have this kind of thing, and they have the same issue. Is it like if you lose your balance on a beakless battle, yeah. you're, you're yeah. out of there? Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So they were doing things like this on purpose. 
right? <laughs> Not because it makes you better at writing, but because it makes you worse at writing, and that's a better test of your skill than otherwise, right? Um, it's also funnier to watch, because when, when somebody topples off a horse, it's funny, right? And that's, a, again, a big part of this kind of culture, is that they, they want to see things that are spectacular. They want to make you do things that are really goofy and weird because it's hard, and because if you do it well when it's really hard, you'll do it even better when it isn't, right? Um, so that's a, a pretty cool one. And the last thing I want to, uh, this is an image of, um, uh, this is also from Friedel, uh, and this is another kind of Hohenzoy Gesteck uh, image there. So you can see a little bit like how impossibly long this guy's legs are. Like look at where his waist is, <laughs> and then look at where his feet are popping out from under the shield, right? So again, it's emphasizing that stretch where you're sitting up like this. <laughs> um, and the idea, again, you get hit and you go, <laughs> You topple right off your horse, right? That's interesting. They did. And there's a armor for the, the, the chest of the horse there. Because again, this is a game where they know you're sitting like this, so your glance is probably doing this, right? And you don't actually want to hurt the other guy's horse because that's not fair. You want to hit the guy, not the horse. How do you see his feet? I guess it's the way they're further. What? Yeah. 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 Like you didn't look that far in yeah. yeah. It's they're impossibly long. But again, yeah, the the emphasis isn't on like, oh, haha, ha, stupid bad art, like dumb medieval artists don't know what legs are, but just because it's emphasizing this, yeah, right? Yeah. It's emphasizing the fact that it's 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 an absolutely unstable structure that you're tenuously balancing on right. with your legs, with that in between your legs, <laughs> right? Um, all right, so the last kind of game we're going to talk about is called a padarm. So a pas d'armes means a pass of arms or a challenge of arms. And the, this is really popular in chivalric literature. It's a, it's a, if you read like Thomas Mallory and the, the King Arthur stories, one of these things happens like every three pages. Somebody sets up at a tree or they set up on a bridge or they set up at a churchyard and anyone who comes by, they say, fight me. And you have to if you're part of that culture, right? If you're, if you're a knight of the round table, you, you gotta. You can't just keep going. Because then, then you, you know, Lancelot will go back and be like, you know, Gawain, he didn't joust me. And people are like, Gawain, you coward. And then he has to go do his Green Knight thing to prove his manliness, right? Um, so this is kind of the idea, right? You, it, it's this classic sort of knightly setup. It's one-on-one. -on -one. It's, it's you reducing down to the barest possible uh, challenge between two knights, right? Two men. That's a lot, yes. So this is a specific historical example of a pas d'arm called the Combat of the Thirty. So the Combat of the Thirty was um, uh, during a war in the 14th century. The two sides decided, like, we don't want to have you know bloody slaughter of several thousand people. We're going to pick 30 champions per side, and we're going to fight it out. And that's what they did. And that was in a war. That was a real war that had real political repercussions. And they chose not not to fight a war the way we would, but they chose to make a fair fight of a war, which if you talk to somebody in the military right now, they say that's the last thing you want to do. Right. You never want to have a fair fight. You always want to stack advantage on advantage on advantage and just kill until it's over. And that's the best result for everybody because now it's over. Whereas this was, no, we're going we're gonna to bet everything on this one fair fight where they're going to pick their 30 best guys and we're going to pick our 30 best guys and we're going to go at it. Um, so, go ahead. Is this something that happened more than once? Or is it yes. Like one specific this is one specific, the combat of the 30 is one specific thing. Okay. But things like this, challenges and in single combats or kind of truncated combats were common in warfare at the time. I yeah. My follow-up question then is, how often did that not just evolve into, well, we lost, but we got more guys back here, so no, we didn't lose. Almost never. Really? Because it because the system's honor, right? And like for for the knight, the war doesn't matter, right? Most of these knights are not fighting for for personal gain; they're fighting because that's their job. And you know, all of these, each of these sixty guys could, in the next month, be fighting a war together against somebody else, yeah. right? Because knighthood is this international brotherhood; it's this international peerage. Yeah. And so it's sort of like if you, if you start going to HEMA tournaments a bunch, you're going to start meeting the same people because it's a small organization right and like i might fight steve cheney here at this tournament 
but then in the next tournament, maybe he's on my team or whatever, right? Like it's it's sort of like that, where you know everyone. All of the like when you read the the sort of um, the chivalric kind of like tributes to the combat of the thirty. One of the things that's like really palpable is that all of these guys know each other and they know each other by reputation. And so when when like the the, the Breton side picks like, ooh, it's it's Jacques de Corbray or whatever, they're like, ooh, that guy's a badass. We better send that guy, right? And so they're like, everyone knows each other. And everyone knows that like the next war they might be on the same team. But right now, it's important to win this combat, right? And so like if if the one side lost, they after the combat of the thirty, I believe the Breton side lost, and they withdrew. They took their whole army and they left because they got beat, and that's that's how it worked. Because knights are the people in charge of wars, and for knights, social promotion is is as important as political victory because it's it's all wrapped up in the same thing. Yeah. Kind of makes sense. That's stuff that I was talking about with you a minute ago. Because all of these people knew each other. And they would demand money from each other. You know, the idea of like suddenly like, oh, we lost, but we didn't. Like that would have terrible yeah. social implications after whatever thing was over. You would never be able to get any kind of anything you wanted done because your currency, your social currency of being an honorable person, yeah, was totally gone at that time. You know, and. It was socially enforced. They all knew yeah. each other. So yeah. like when, you, when you write a feud letter, you're saying, like, you haven't paid a demand you pay, which would make all this fighting stop. If, if you stop being a man of your word at that point, nobody's ever going to come to you. Yeah. So it's not also to say that, like, if these guys were fighting, say, the Swiss, that they wouldn't drown 300 of them one at a time. Because that kind of thing did happen. And, like, slaughtering the defenders of castles and, like, that kind of brutality was still very much a part of warfare, but generally not toward other knights, because those are the professionals. Those are the people that are that's that's just what they have to do on earth, right? Whereas like the Swiss are these sort of like bizarre, murderous, like uh, like like they don't care about nobility and they'll kill knights rather than ransom them. And they're these these holy kind of it's almost like a class war sort of connotation. There's actually a term by the late 15th century called turning Swiss, which was basically shorthand for class war. Where like, if, oh, that city turned Swiss, means like they're going to slaughter the nobility and they're going to join the Swiss League, right? And so like, yeah, if, you, if you're an army of knights and you come across an army of Swiss and they surrender, well, yeah, maybe you kick them each into like Constance one at a time while everybody's tied together. Like that happened. That happened in, in a war in Switzerland in the 15th century. So that kind of thing was common, but generally not among other knights, generally. And it, it of course, did happen. Like Agincourt was kind of notorious, right? Um, uh, Henry V like, ordered the slaughter of a bunch of captured knights and, and did. And it's still kind of historically controversial. You can see historians trying to explain it. And other historians are like, no, this was like a gross violation of the rules of war, right? Um, so that kind of thing was taken very, very, very seriously. Uh, and it was very rare to see that kind of being uh, transgressed in a way that wasn't sort of, that didn't have a pretext, right? Okay, so lastly, trying to connect this back to, to HEMA, right? So we have this, this whole idea of Ernst versus Schimpf. And I just have this guy up there because, like, look at him. <laughs> uh, this is also from the, the Meyer 1561 uh, image. So if you ever just want to look at the images of that, I recommend you do it because they're great. What were you saying? He looks like an idiot. <laughs> no, he's just, he just really wants to hit that pikeman. That's, uh, that's the pike running across that he's bypassing with his halberd, right? Um, but again, like I said earlier, right, we, we tend to think earnest means deadly. And it's like when it's earnest, it means somebody's going to die. It means somebody's, you just go until somebody's dead and that's the end, right? But Ernest, when we look at games that they took very seriously, that were a big part of the culture, no knight on earth would have, would have even gone into like the goofy Hohenzoi Gesteck and thought it was anything other than Ernest. What they're doing is proving their value to the culture in which their job is to fight wars. And tournaments and, and other kind of public sort of fencing and public competition gave them an opportunity to do that where they didn't have to kill people. 
Uh, and generally, that was preferred. And there are many, 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 many more tournaments than there are battles and wars, right? Because even, even in a war, you, you're not guaranteed in this time period to have a battle or anything resembling a battle. It was like when Brian was talking about the, the Margrave War, it's a lot of raiding, it's a lot of capturing merchants who are supplying the armies, it's a lot of surprise attacks at night where you go and kill as many people as possible and then leave. Um, it's that kind of thing. And so when we think of earnest, it's mostly just any time anyone makes a choice that this is something that has stakes. That's what makes it earnest. So when we're looking at Fexbucher and we're saying, oh, earnest, well, that means I better kill the guy. No, it doesn't. It just means there's something on the line. Whether that's just your reputation or it's a prize or it's some ability to promote yourself socially or there's women watching and I'm not married yet. Um, or your children are watching and you want them you want you want them to have a positive role model right all of these very just human emotions get tied up into this stuff and it's it's not something we can just set aside because we want to see fencing as something that's inherently deadly right because it, it wasn't but it was there is a difference between serious and playful and playful can be anything you can you can just be playful anywhere and like i imagine most of the people in a colbin turnier didn't take it too seriously you're riding around without a saddle with a wooden club trying to like knock somebody's like sausage crest off their head, right? That's that's the thing. And like they did it enough that it was it had its own name and it shows up in like Maximilian's tournament book because it's just a game people played and it was fun. Um, but they're sort of separating these kind of games into sort of different levels of serious uh, seriousness. And it's it's really important for us to understand that there's that much leeway between something they took seriously, right, has this massive scope because it could include everything from slaughtering Swiss peasants down to uh, doing a pas d'arme where you're, you're doing something very, very, very particular, right? And so um, rather than the Comet of the 30, there's another pas d'arme uh, that happened in France in the 14th century where it was 30 knights uh, got together and they rode out to a specific tree. And these 30 knights were each hosted in three different castles, and they stayed there for a year. And anyone from all around knew that they were there and could come and challenge them. And there were like two shields hanging from a tree, and you hit the one shield and it says you're going to fight on foot with the swords, and you hit another one that said you're going to joust or whatever, right? Um, and there's all of these like chivalric lays about it and stories about it because like they were literally camping out there for a year fighting anyone who would come by, right? And that was their, that, these were people who like, run castles and own villages and are people who are politically and economically powerful wasting a year of their lives camping out by a tree fighting right that's ridiculous but it was a thing that they saw they derived a lot of value from because it's it's a way to to very prominently and very publicly put on display how much of a real man you are right and and this idea of manliness and masculinity is all tied into this and again like the more willing you are to endure pain, the more willing you are to like lose and get back up and do it again, uh, is your more value as a knight. And obviously they, they still thought skill and victory and everything were really important too, of course. Um, but that's less prominent than it is for us in competitions today. Because in competitions today, that's the entire point. Win at all costs, right? And you see very few people who are not playing the game that way. Whereas historically, that would have been a weird concept, and I think that would have been off-putting to a lot of knights. Like, you're just here to, to, to win? There's so much more. <laughs> There's so much more to it than that, right? Um, and it Right, right. And, but, and it would just be one of those things, too, where it's like, oh, that guy's here, and he, he always takes everything way too seriously, right? And it's like, oh, I don't want to joust that guy. He's going to give me a concussion, right? <laughs> um, so, so these sort of like has to lose, right? These games allowed men to sort of perform their violent role, which was taken very seriously in, in ways that were kind of safer or at least more promotive of good behavior and also allowed for opportunities for marriage and allowed for opportunities for socializing with other knights, meeting and socializing with knights from other territories, right? As, as an imperial knight, you might meet and befriend and eventually marry the sister of Burgundian knights and, and things like that, right? It created this international brotherhood because when you're not at war with people, you still go fight them because that's your job. That's what you do. That is your whole purpose on earth is fighting. And you take every opportunity to do it. And sometimes fighting.
fighting is just done in the form of ridiculous games where you're strapped into a, a you know, <laughs> a step ladder on top of a horse and jousting uh -huh. while doing a handstand or whatever, right? <laughs> and like these kind of things were were real. And I think like if if we kind of unpack this and we look at this in terms of like how are we approaching HEMA today and try to compare it, I'm not saying we need to strap people into high saddles or whatever, but approaching things in terms of like you are the one in charge of whether you take it seriously or not. And you're the one in charge of how you fence. And you're the one in charge of like how you want to how, how you want to be known in the community. And if you're somebody who's going around and you're only going to win and you don't care if you concuss people and you don't care if you break the rules as long as you win because there's a sharp sword on the line, that's a little out of step historically because there's so much more. And even within, even within HEMA, obviously, there's so, mu so many more kind of avenues to show off than just winning. Um, and I think, I think it would make us, I think, a better community and more interesting fencers if we understood more that fencing is what gives us an opportunity to kind of show ourselves rather than just winning, right? Um, and that's more or less basically it. I mean, I, I, we've got 10 minutes or so for questions. Um, I've got, these are my sources here. Um, if you want to ask about anything else. Yeah. The 30 guys, who yeah. were they fighting for in that one? Uh, I don't honestly remember. <laughs> if you look up combat of the 30, it's a, it, it has like a Wikipedia page. Um, and you can read the, um, the translated like chivalric lay of the whole thing. Um, so you can find a lot more detail. I, it's part of one of the many, many, many weird derivative little wars that were going on in the 14th century. So I, I can't remember the exact circumstances. Right. Yeah. Got another question. Yes. Yeah, the guys who camped out the castle and you could hit either shields yeah. or them. Were there rules on when you could or could not hit them? Like if, like just thinking, I would train until I could like be amped at 2 a.m. and the yeah. guys are asleep and I'm gonna wake them up. Yeah. Well, so they 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 <laughs> slept at castles. So I think it, it would have had to have been when they were actually by the tree, yeah, so right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um. So, but but also like when you retire to the castle, it's it's like they're feasting, right? So you're spending an entire year going out and jousting your friends or whatever and anybody who shows up and then you're going back and just partying like for a year right right yeah <laughs> yeah right yeah just out there alone so there is a really funny story about that um that there was an english knight who showed up and like brags about how he's like i'll fight seven passes with the sword with anybody and he went up and like struck the shield and then when it came time for him to come out he just left <laughs> he just like he just like slunk away <laughs> um and and or no, no 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 it was that he was supposed to get ready and then he was like well i don't have this particular piece of armor and somebody's like i'll lend it to you and he was like uh... <laughs> he just... <laughs> right um so so again like and and this is kind of shows like shame is a very powerful tool right when when you show up and you behave in a way that's not that's not part of the game that's shameful and that that reputation will follow you right so it's really really important yeah jeff um going back to the, the catapult shield yeah do you know how they made them i very... don't because we only have unfortunately we only have like the picture of the the mounting bracket mm -hmm. right we i i have never seen a picture no of You're talking about just the basic part organically right it i mean oh no it's foot combats it's pretty it's wintery. Yeah, so so from from obviously the images, we know pieces of it came off. Yeah. I have not seen a shield, so I don't know how they may have been constructed, right? Yeah, yeah. It so it could be like you've got a kind of piece of steel, and then, yeah. It, I imagine it was something that was like made to break, obviously, right? Um, they could have used a gunpowder charge to do it, and that probably would have looked really cool because uh, they had gunpowder around this time and it, it had been in common use in warfare for like more than 100 years by then. So um, that could have been a thing. It also just literally could have been spring-loaded, right? Um, but the idea is, again, it shoots up and it flashes in the sun and everything like that. But like, I cannot imagine if you had the opportunity to stuff it full of fireworks, you wouldn't have, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, one guy. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Oh, oh Charles. Scoring <laughs> could be historically. Yeah, it could be. Yeah. <laughs> like, so I want to. 
<laughs> exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I want to see. I want to see the uh, a tournament where we have fireworks in our and he gets hit and shoots up in the sky. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We need more Colbin Trinier. Yeah. Yeah. Um, any other questions? Yeah, Tyler. Yeah. How do you organize something like that? Like not not during the competition, but like how do these guys decide? All right, we're going to be over here, and we're going to be over here. It so from at least from the history of William Marshall, which is the the one I'm most familiar with, talking about it's the, the details of it. It's just a thing where it's like, oh, we're all here. You want to go do a tournament? And people are like, sure. And they just ride out to the nearest village. It's convenient. And it's like, who cares about the peasants who are like working the fields? Who are now like, <laughs> like, ah, come on. <laughs> I got to get in my, I got to bring in my alfalfa crop. And you got knights riding around it all over the place. Um, I, I don't know. I've never actually seen like a, a sort of breakdown of how they were organized. I just know they happened and were pretty common. Um, they also tended to happen in, at least according to the history of William Marshall, because he was, he, he was a knight as part of the, uh, um, the Angevin Empire, right, which is sort of what we now call England in the western half of France. But this was during uh, a notoriously violent time. This was like constant warfare between the Angevins and Capetians. They were constantly at war, and whenever they weren't at war, they were at tournament together. Uh, and this is, again, what I mean, right? When the war is off, you still go fight those same knights. You're just doing it at a tournament now rather than in war. And in a war, the goal between knights is not to kill other knights. It's to capture them for ransom. So, yeah, yeah. Right, right. Well, a footman could still capture knights. Yes, yes. And so, like, there we know that there were some commoners who managed to like dismount uh, knights and capture them, and they they shared the ransom, right? Um, but usually, what would happen, and this is just because it's it's the sort of like collegiate culture, basically is, let's say, all, all of our scrappy halberd boys pull a knight down off his horse and capture him, we probably turn him over to the nearest knight who then pays us, right, knowing that he's going to get paid for the ransom in the future anyway, and now he can host them in the style that he needs to be, right, because he's still nobility, and you're not going to have a knight move into, like, your little hovel with your wife and seven children, right? <laughs> and, and, like, you get to sleep on the hearth. That's the most comfortable you know, place in the house, right? So they're probably handed over to the nobility who will then pay you or not, or pay you a, a, a portion of the value of them, and then they'd get their, collect their ransom later. Yeah. Jerry, yeah. So I'm getting a few acquaintances that are competing this sport that I'm sure we're all familiar with, all the mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, I find it hard to debate them on the historical this mm -hmm. their historical. Yeah. Like, do you have more insight uh, so I think like Buhert and Battle of the Nations and, and that kind of thing is interesting in that they do more or less replicate a particular style of melee that, that were popular at the time. And I have seen like HMB games and videos that do have a barrier and they use pole arms and they have rules that are historical. Um, but the thing is like, there's no... From what I've seen, and I'm not very familiar with it, so don't take my word for it, but from what I've seen of, of the, the kinds of videos that are popular about that kind of sport, is they lean so far into the brutality of it, and they have absolutely no attempt to do the chivalry part of it, that, that physically, sh maybe, they're pretty close to what people were actually doing to each other. And like they didn't care about concussions, and again, taking that kind of damage was as prominent as dishing it out. And that was a big thing for you as a person. Um, but like without having poetry and without having courtly dances afterward and without having feasts and without having any of the chivalry and any of the kind of culture that promotes certain types of behaviors over others, it's just a concussion game, right? And I have no interest in, in that kind of thing. But there is a way to look at it that they are replicating in, in, a, in a very modern way a kind of game that was played by knights at the time. And, and as far as that goes, that's great. I would do it very differently, 
Um, and I would do it in a way that, I don't know, encourage people to have armor that fit, for one thing. Um, but it is something where, like, I think in terms, again, if you're only looking at the physicality of it, I think probably HMB is pretty close to way a lot, the way a lot of melees would work. But you also can't wrestle. And wrestling somebody to the ground and forcing their surrender is how you make money in a, in a melee, right? And so, like, without, without, without the sense of, like, ransoms and this sort of peer policing toward chivalry, like, you can't force them to be chivalric, right? Um, but you could structure a game that rewards that kind of behavior, and they're not doing that. They're, they're just taking, you get 30 guys on each team, and they're going to go bash each other until they're unconscious, and that's HMB. And that's, I'm not into that. Because again, it's just a concussion machine. I don't, I don't like it. <laughs> that um, sounds very not fun. Yeah, I mean, and there are a lot of again, like I don't know it super well, so I, I don't want to be taken as criticizing like a whole sport, sport I'm not super familiar with. But from what I've seen, I'm not interested in learning more. <laughs> uh, terrible. Yeah, like yeah. Um, so and and I know that there are like um, things like the uh, Decoven uh, Accords. If you're familiar with that, uh, it's the like the armor. They call it the armor deed at like WMAW. Do things that are more similar to other kinds of tournament games that were also happening concurrently with big melees that they're doing with like HMB. Um, so the biggest thing is like if you isolate just that, it's like professional jousting too. If you isolate just the jousting from everything else, you're going to end up with something quite different than it was historically. But that's not to say it's not valuable, right? And ideally, you would have jousts and melees and all the same guys doing all the same stuff. But the problem is we don't have a production culture that makes armor to fit. And we don't have people that make enough money and are literally in a social class where their only function is to do stuff like this. And so, of course, we're never going to be able to perfectly replicate it unless we get a billionaire who's just frivolously giving money away to people to be knights, right? And that would be its own level of weirdness that's ahistorical, right? Yeah. Right, exactly, yeah. So, and again, so basically what I would say is I'd, I'll be interested in the Bluehurt stuff once they start having courtly dances and chivalry and marriages and weddings and all that stuff. Yeah, yeah. Let's do dance dancers. Yeah. Non dancers mean not Yeah, yeah. All right, any other questions? All right, thank you.